There's only one question on everyone's mind this week. Will Bitcoin keep going up? This past week, Bitcoin briefly touched all-time highs above 69,000 and then immediately dropped over 10% to below 62,000. Now, in today's episode, we're going to tell you the five reasons we believe that Bitcoin has a lot further to go from here. GMGM, welcome to Web3 Academy, your one trusted source to capitalize on the next big phase of the internet. We are here to make sense of an on-chain world in constant transformation. I'm Jay Bird, along with my co-host Kyle Reedhead, and we believe that retail is coming and it's going to change your world. Jay thinks Bitcoin's going up. I'll tell you something that's going to go up even more. That's what we're going to talk about after we talk about Bitcoin. We'll tell you what's going to outperform Bitcoin. We're going to talk about meme coin season, which probably will also perform Bitcoin, which is not something I love, but hey, it's great. It's all fun. But we got to cover it because it is just popping off. Robinhood and Revolut are coming for your crypto. You choose if you want to give it to them or not, but at least they're building and they're making some cool stuff. So we'll talk about that. But the coolest company of them all in crypto, well, that's Coinbase. It's an absolute beast. We, of course, have more we're going to talk about on Coinbase launching some things and just what's going on with its app. It is airdrop mania this week. I know we've said we that like it's been airdrop mania for a while, but this week, some of the biggest airdrops are happening, a bunch that we have covered in guides. So we're going to get you up to speed on what's happening there and what you can continue to get. Uh, and then we'll get into some agreed disagrees. But there's just so much going on this week. It's a big week, especially markets. So the market watch is probably going to be a bigger part of our of our episode today, I'm thinking. And always, if you haven't already done so, please hook us up with a like or follow or maybe a review on whatever platform you're listening on. It makes a big difference for us in the show as we try to get more people on chain and help us all win. Everybody's a winner here at Web3 Academy, so make sure you do that. And also subscribe to our newsletter. Link is in the show notes. And today's poll question, we want to know if you have ever bought or sold crypto on PayPal, Revolut, Robinhood, or another fintech app. So wherever you're listening, give us a comment and let us know if you're buying or selling on fintech apps. We're curious to know who's in that space. I had not been to the answer is no. Yeah, I mean, me neither. I bought, Although, yeah, you know what? You know what? Actually, you and I both have. They're just less known fintech apps. Like, you got to consider, I guess, maybe ShakePay and what we use in Canada. Oh, that's a crypto exchange. Apps. That's a crypto, crypto exchange. exchange. Yeah, you're right. You're yeah. right. No, we never have. Anyway, did you want to transition me into the market watch or what do you want to do there, Jay? I think you just transitioned quite nicely. Kyle, what's <laughs> going on in the markets this week? <laughs> well, we'll start with Bitcoin because it made its all time high, which is actually hilarious. It just pumped all the way to it and then immediately just shot down, like you said, 10%. It was hilarious to watch and just exact crypto fashion. It was perfect. But we did just touch like a couple bucks above the previous all-time highs. So we could celebrate this week. We are now below it. Bitcoin's currently sitting at $67,237, which is incredible and really, really cool. It's up 1.6% today. And up 7.46% on the week, despite having some crazy volatility. But either way, exciting things going on in the Bitcoin world. And we're going to talk more about that uh, later on in the show. If we move on to Ethereum, though, uh, Ethereum has been a bit of a beast. Since Bitcoin hit its all-time high, it just skyrocketed. And Ethereum began to outperform, outperform the moment that happened. Ethereum is up 13% on the week, 0.15% uh, today, but currently sitting at $3,825, which is pretty amazing. I mean, I feel like Ethereum was at like 2200 a couple weeks ago or a couple days ago even. I'm not sure, but yeah, it's been a bit of a beast. What do you look at about Solana, Kai? <laughs> see, diving in, I'm like, what's he see that I don't see? Solana just was lagging for a bit and then um, it just absolutely ripped basically yesterday slash a bit today. Actually, I guess it's mainly today. Look, it's up 12.3% in the last 24 hours, up 23.6% in the last week. Solana is currently sitting at $147 and it is clear skies ahead. I put out a tweet this morning. This thing's going to 175 faster than you can say. I don't remember what the meme coin was, but like Shiba, Obama, Ibu, Harry Potter, whatever, Harry Potter, Bu- Pac-Man, <laughs> that thing. So you can't say it, which is why I think Solana's going to get there faster than anyone else can say it. <laughs> but yeah, Solana has been on an absolute tear, which everyone thought it was going to lag, but it, it said, nope, I'm going to join this party as well. And then we'll finish off with the crypto total market cap, which 
is at $2.46 trillion, uh, up 10% on the week, 1.42% uh, on the day. I believe actually this week it did go past $2.5 trillion. So we are growing up as an industry and becoming a big boy in the global financial world, which is pretty exciting. Let's go. Let's go, everybody. Holy geez. Hold on to your pants. Hold on to your shirts. Things are flying off the top. But the question that everybody wants to know is always, where do we go from here? Yeah, it's great to celebrate the past, but what is coming up? Kai, what are you seeing that's giving you conviction for why we are still in such a good place and why we still have higher to go? Yeah. So, I mean, I feel like a broken record at this point, how many weeks in a row we've talked about the flows of Bitcoin ETFs. It's just, they're so powerful and they just keep growing week after week. It's absolutely crazy. And it's, there's no doubt this is the reason why Bitcoin is doing what it is. So we'll talk about a bit of this flow stuff and the demand around Bitcoin. But then we're also going to talk about how we're still not like sort of overbought, burnt out just yet. We're getting close. There are some things. This 10% correction we had was very much needed, but plenty of room to go. And then I want to talk about some historical things, looking at historically what's happened when Bitcoin has reached its all-time high. I'll tell you right now, the answer is extremely bullish, but I'm going to show you exact numbers. So to get things started, I just want to show a nice chart here of the total Bitcoin in ETFs currently, which has been up and up and up, obviously, since the ETFs launch. But they're currently creeping up to 800,000 Bitcoins. 800,000. We're getting close to 1 million Bitcoins. Remember, folks, there's only 21 million of these things. And currently, 800,000 is in all the Bitcoin ETFs currently. Um, that number is just absolutely nuts. And then, you know, the growth that we've had so far since the ETFs launched is only picking up. We are literally starting to just reach massive numbers. When So seven weeks ago, when the ETFs all launched, obviously we had GPTC that already existed that had about 30 billion assets in it. We're currently sitting at 50 billion. About 8 billion of that is from actual capital, like flowing into the ETFs. And then the rest is from just the growth of Bitcoin because we've obviously like, I don't know, probably close to doubled since those ETFs were live. I don't know, it's a bit doubled, but we've done really, really well. So that's really what's going on there. And then if we look just on the 6th, I guess it was the 5th. So this was the day after we hit the all-time highs. iBit, which took in a record smashing 788 million in one day. So absolutely just massive. It was the record for ETFs so far. And that was in the day that we went down 10%. And then we're talking float. So like we still had almost a billion dollars come into this one ETF on the day that we actually had a 10% decrease. So kind of what it's showing, at least what Eric Balkuna says here up on the tweet is like, look, people think that the ETF investors are just like retail. They're going to be not hodling, not holding much, but it showed, you know, they're still buying, even though the asset itself went down 10%. One of the rumors of why it went down 10% is a holder that has been holding Bitcoin for, I think it was 12 years decided to dump like thousands of Bitcoin the moment it reached all-time highs. It was pretty ridiculous. They haven't sold in 12 years and they chose the day that we hit all-time highs to do it. So it was pretty wild. I wish I had that, that chart up, but I don't have it here, but it's pretty interesting. But look, who's buying these ETFs? Man, everyone. Like there's a bunch of retail, sure, but like BlackRock is now um, buying its own Bitcoin ETFs in some of its other funds. So we've talked a little bit about that. Banks themselves are starting to. So the Bank of America... Wells Fargo are offering the spot Bitcoin ETFs as well to their clients. And outside of ETFs, of course, there's more companies and people that are buying Bitcoin. Guess who? Our boy Michael Saylor has raised or borrowed $700 million. And what's wild is the interest rates, I don't know how this guy does it, but it's 0.625%. Interest rates for you and me and everyone else in the world is like 5.2%. And uh, this guy with a multi-billion dollar company gets it for 0.6%. So he's borrowed $700 million. Do you know what he's going to do with that $700 million, Jay? Buy Bitcoin. Oh, yeah. He's going to buy a lot more Bitcoin. So like, you have almost a million Bitcoin in these ETFs. And then you have Sailor buying hundreds of millions of dollars every single month as well. The demand on Bitcoin right now is nuts. And there's probably other like countries and sovereign wealth funds that are buying as well that haven't announced it yet. I also saw a rumor this morning that Tesla has recently bought more. We're not sure if it's they've bought more or if it's because they're now accepting Bitcoin to buy Teslas. But the wallets that we believe is Teslas has um, started to increase in the number of Bitcoin it's holding. So we'll see what happens on their earnings call. So it's clear there's a lot of demand for Bitcoin. Now, here's the thing. Things were getting a little bit toppy over the last week, right? We started to get retail coming back. At least I'll show you a chart that looks like this. 
it was getting a bit out of control. Meme coin season's going off, which we'll talk about. And obviously, Bitcoin just ripped like 50% in a matter of like a month. So like, is this sustainable? And the answer is, I mean, probably not in terms of like that gro- like rate of growth. If we look at the fear and greed index, which is a very popular indicator that just looks at how bullish or how bearish people are on a particular as- asset, this one is specific to crypto. And we're currently sitting at 82, which is basically extreme greed. We're more into the green side of things right now. We haven't been at that for a little while. But the last time that we hit this sort of extreme, extreme greed was right here, which I have a chart up on, which is the Bitcoin price color coded by the fear and greed index. So looking at the price of Bitcoin uh, and applying when this thing went green, which is the scenario that we're in right now, we sustained this for over, I believe it was like 90 days mm-hmm. in the last cycle back in 2021. Well, end of 2020 and early 2021, basically around the time that we surpassed all time highs as well. And we went from 20K up to 60K during that time. So, and again, 20K was the previous all-time high. I'll talk about that more in just a second. So we are definitely like pretty toppy in terms of the fear and greed index. But as we've seen before, we can sustain this for a while. I feel like this doesn't happen in other markets, but in crypto, we can just stay super bullish for a pretty long time. So we'll see how that goes. I put out a, a poll yesterday and I asked, I was like, be honest, crypto Twitter, how many times in the last 30 days have you recalculated your net worth? So not just opening up CoinGecko and looking at what the prices are doing, literally gone and recalculated your entire net worth. And I put once or twice daily, multiple times a day, or no, I don't look at it. And 48% of people are currently recalculating their net worth daily. And 29%, which came second, is multiple times in a day. (laughs) What industry can you recalculate your net worth multiple times a day and it actually makes a difference? Only in crypto, but again, this is what happens in bull markets. So these are somewhat top signals. We've talked a little bit, mainly in our pro reports, about retail coming back in and some of the ways you can look at you know, when they're coming back in and by how much. One nice one is just Coinbase, how many people are actually downloading the app. And so where does it rank in the app store? And so we were sitting pretty low for a while here. When we get into full bull mania, Coinbase goes to the top of, of the app store. And uh, over the last week, this chart has gone parabolic and Coinbase currently, well, at least this was two days ago, was 49th in the app store, basically going up from about like 400. So it has just gone absolute parabolic. I think it's come back a bit now. I saw a tweet this morning around like 70 or 75, but either way, that is a signal that, okay, people are coming back and starting to activate their Coinbase account. So anyway, it's not too bad yet. We're not at number one. When we get to number one, that's when you got to be a little bit scared. So one more thing just on where we are, Leading up to that all-time high that we hit earlier this week, you can see on this chart here of funding rates. So this is people taking out leverage. And just the day before we hit that all-time high, it was full-on orange the whole way, which basically means everyone was leveraged long. And so, of course, what happens when you reach that point? We completely blew everyone out. And it didn't matter if you were long or short. On the day that we hit that all-time highs, you got rocked no matter what. If you had any leverage, you were getting liquidated. And it basically cleared the entire thing. So every exchange all across the board cleared their their leverage. And that set us up to what do we do next? Well, two days after, everyone starts going long again. That's just what the industry does. But we're not nowhere near those numbers that we were as we hit all-time highs. So what I want to say here from all this is, yes, we're looking a bit toppy. We're looking a bit too bullish, but there's still a lot of room to go. Plus, there's all this demand on the other side. And then, Jay, here's the most bullish thing that I've seen which is here's the time it took Bitcoin to double after it reached previous all-time highs, after it broke previous all-time highs in the previous cycle. So December 2020, so this is the last time we hit the previous all-time high, which was about 20K, 18 days, and we had hit 40K. March 2017, I think the all-time high was like 1,400 or something around that. After we surpassed that, 84 days. So less than three months that we doubled. November 2013, 10 days and we doubled. And then March, 2013, 18 days. So the numbers are pretty significant. And will that happen again? I mean, who knows, but it's happened many, many times before. It happens every time we reach all-time highs in a new cycle. So in the next 90 days or less, we probably double. I don't know. I mean, that would be pretty sweet. Uh, but I mean, now I think about like, okay, what does that mean to double at these numbers? And like, we're at 69,000. We've got to go like above 130. 
I don't that's just 130k like that's wild it seems uh, crazy like, right it seems it does, crazy it seem but it crazy. seemed crazy last time too every time it's happened last time it also seemed of crazy point. so you got a good point like fundamentals go out the window in a lot of ways and not to mention the bitcoin having is coming we haven't even mentioned that yeah yet. didn't mean that's we're what what are we now one month away basically one month away from that happening bitcoin's a 1.3 or 4 ish trillion dollar asset so we would have to bring another $1.4 trillion to that market cap to double it in 90 days. <laughs> we'll see. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously hoping it happens, but I don't know. That seems a bit wild. Well, how how tell much you what have I... we brought in since the ETFs? We've brought in about, uh, I think about $350 billion. I think it's like $330 billion since the ETFs launched, like roughly. Yeah. Because yeah. we so oh, more of that because we were under a trillion, I think, before those launched. Pretty sure. Okay, so, or at least we were close to it. So yeah. So maybe $400 billion. 500 somewhere in that range so can we double that in the next 30 days probably look and interest rates are still high let's bring interest right. rates down and see what happens to that market cap right so there's there's still tons of room of bullishness so i think we're just still nowhere near the top look will a pull, pullback happen potentially i actually put a I have a pro report coming out next week all about pullbacks so make sure you check that out who knows on pullbacks at this point there's too much demand at the moment I'll tell you what could double, and I could see it doubling, and I would have no issue with it. I, I obviously would have no issue with it, but we think Bitcoin does really well after it reaches all-time highs. So we said it doubles within like, I don't know, under 30 days, max under 90 days, if we look at every other cycle previously. Well, I'll tell you what does even more than that. Right after Bitcoin hits all-time highs, that's ETH. ETH, this is the moment when ETH significantly outperforms Bitcoin. So look at these numbers. If we look at the last cycle, so 2020, 2021, few days after Bitcoin hit its all-time high, that's when it marked the bottom and ETH significantly outperformed. So after that all-time high, Bitcoin did a 3x from 20K in just a few months. We just talked about that with that fear and greed index. It was about 90 days. Okay. In that same time frame, Ethereum did an 8x. An 8x in 90 days. Like these numbers are nuts. That's what it did last cycle. If, could you imagine if ETH Eight X's right now. Look, it, I do, it's not going to happen. That would be insane. At the time, ETH was five hundred and fifty bucks, right? So it went from five fifty to whatever that eight X is. I, I don't even know. I don't have the chart up here. I have an ETH Bitcoin ratio. But if we look at this chart that I have up on the screen, I mean, it looks like ETH completely dominated Bitcoin because it did. But this, what would you look at this? You would think, okay, Bitcoin went down, Ethereum went up, but no, Bitcoin tripled, but ETH eight X. It's just. It's nuts. And I mean, we saw it the moment we hit all time high on Bitcoin. I tweeted this out and boom, ETH just skyrocketed right away. And it looked like it put in that low again on the ETH BTC, the, the local low. We'll see what happens. Again, the dynamics are a bit different with ETFs, but we have that ETH. I mean, there's a couple things. We've got the ETH ETF coming in two months. And then we've got the EIP 4844 happening literally next week. By the time we come on this podcast next week, that thing's going to be live. L2s are going to be pennies, if not cheaper. So I don't know, man. It's a good time to be in crypto. That's my like summary of everything I just talked about. Yeah. I, what I take away from this is like, okay, so Bitcoin continues to rise. It seems insane to say that it's going to double over the next 90 days, but totally possible. Definitely, yeah. definitely riding. ETH is going to outperform Bitcoin. I think that also is fairly likely. Maybe ETH does like two to three X over the next like Again, when I say these numbers out loud, it just seems absolutely fucking insane, but we're in an insane world. But then when let you go down further, like what does that mean for Soul then, right? Like <laughs> is Soul the one that has the potential? If ETH had the 8X last time, can Soul do more a, I don't know, 8X seems crazy for Soul too, but maybe a 5X or a 4X? Like that would put Soul at like 800 to to $1,000. Yeah. Th- that's kind of where I marked it for the end of like its top of the cycle. But again, who knows, man? The, the only thing with Solana is it doesn't get the demand of an ETF, which is obviously a massive thing. So that's the one thing. I still think Solana outperforms ETH without a doubt this cycle. I don't know if it happens in the 90 days. And the reason I say that is within these 90 days is when ETH gets its ETF. And so I just think it's going to get a lot of capital from that. Though like very soon after, Solana is going to outperform. So anyway, you stay in any of these three assets and you're good. Don't try to jump around. What I notice people keep doing is like, oh, Solana was lagging a couple of days ago, but ETH really took off. So they like, they sell their soul and put it to ETH. And then you look at what happens. And in one day, Solana goes up 12%. It's like, just keep dollar cost averaging into both of them or all three if you want some Bitcoin exposure too. Uh, but at this point, like I wouldn't be buying any Bitcoin. 
I've rotated everything to Ethan Salata. And like, I just continue to buy those because we still have a lot, a lot to go here. Obviously, you can go farther down the risk curve, but we'll no, we're not going to cover any of that today. Okay. Well, that was the most bullish market watch we've had in a while. In the same week that we hit all-time highs, it's insane. Okay. Let's go to something that is going even more crazy this past week, which is meme coins. I've got up on the screen here the chart of the top six meme coins, which are made up of five dogs and a frog. No, that's not a joke. <laughs> And these top six meme coins in the past seven days, most of them have gone up over 100% up to the highest is Pepe has gone up 137% in the past week alone. I'm sure everybody listening to this, you, you've seen it, you've heard it. Everyone's talking meme coin season, meme coin season. Holy shit, things are going crazy. There's a couple things to discuss here. First, why is this happening? Well, it's happening for a few simple reasons. One is we're starting to see meme coins listed on more exchanges. This past week, Robinhood listed dog with hat. Binance listed dog with hat this past week. We're seeing more and more of the top exchanges picking up meme coins, which just gives more access to traders to be able to purchase and buy these meme coins. We've also seen Bloomberg News talk about meme coins. I've got a photo up on the screen here and It's two very respectable Bloomberg analysts up on screen. And I wish I had the clip of what they're saying here because I can just imagine them saying, meme coin frenzy reaches a crescendo on the back of a Bitcoin rally. (laughs) Pepe, a frog themed coin and dog with hat. Yes, a dog pictured wearing a hat have been racking up fresh highs almost daily according to data (laughs) from CoinGecko. So you can just imagine a Bloomberg analyst trying to explain to a TradFi investor what the F of meme coin is and a frog and a dog with a hat are reaching all-time highs. What? It's one of those things where they're trying to value it and they're trying to make sense of it. And it's like, as we all know, we've talked about this all the time, they're not something you can make sense of. It just is what it is. You have to respect it. You can't ignore it. You can't be closed-minded about it. You have to be open but you're not valuing these things. They're just gambling casinos of online communities of people having fun and making and losing a lot of money. And that's just the vibe. (laughs) And they will never get that. (laughs) No, I barely get it. And I'm in my mid thirties. God, I've never said that in my life. I'm in my early thirties. You know what I I do get (laughs) and I love is Robert F. Kennedy Jr. was at ETH Denver this past week, which is amazing to see the mainstream come into ETH Denver in this way. And here he is wearing Mog glasses, which are glasses that are used by one of the meme coins, Mob Mog coin, uh, which is also a dog, not a shock. These are all dogs. Oh, sorry, it's a cat. Sorry, Mog is a cat. Is he a cat, dog, or frog? And he's wearing these, these shades. And Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is wearing these shades and has tons of photos online. And so Mog went crazy. What's even more than, well, I don't think it's more than the meme coins, but the other one that's really popping off that we don't have a slide up for it, but is AI crypto coins. I was just looking, I was like, you know what? I think they're doing better than meme coins. I just look, they're crushing it, but they're actually nowhere near the chart you just sh- showed. So not even worth talking about. <laughs> These things are up like 23% a day and we're like, yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> the best one, which one are you about to show? Oh man, this is the best one. This is the best one. This is what I tried to say earlier in the show. Harry uh, Potter Obama Pac-Man 8 Inu is up 385% in the past week. Look, I'm not saying you should go buy this. I don't know what the fuck this meme coin is. It's basically just every buzzword of like, I think what is trendy to meme coin, crypto degens, right? Like they I love Harry Potter, apparently. I love Harry Potter, so rock on. Obama, I guess they all love Obama too. I, I don't know, but these yeah, things yeah. make where's zero yeah. seven. But they're all going they're all going to the moon, right? Not forever, but they're going to the moon right now because and this is what has happened several times before is when meme coins go crazy, it is usually the indicator of the early stages of bull runs because when typically early in bull runs Bitcoin goes crazy. Then it kind of trickles down to ETH and Sol, which we've seen. And people get rich and they get really excited and they want to play the casino. 
And meme coins are often the first casino that you play before altcoins, which is shocking because altcoins actually have businesses that are sustainable. Not all of them, but a lot of them do. And I believe in altcoins and you can value them on fundamentals. Meme coins, you can't, but that's who's in the space. Our space is built up of crypto degens who get very excited and meme coins are a lot of fun. But I think the main thing that gets me excited here is not the meme coin season because I'm not going buy meme coins. Kai, are you going to go buy meme coins? I haven't bought any meme coins, but I did get airdropped when meme coin, which is a cat on okay. Solana. Uh, yeah. I forget why I got airdropped. And I was like, you know what? I'm not selling. I mean, it was like 30 bucks. I was like, screw it. I'm not selling this thing. I want to ride this thing out. And it's almost at 300 bucks right now. So I've 10 x it and I'm, I'm holding strong. I'm a when guy now. <laughs> I have no idea what it is. I did see that. As soon as they launched, though, they bought a Twitter account of like, I don't know, it was like millions of subscribers of cat fans. And I don't know what they're going to do with this Twitter account, but it is a meme token around cats. So like, I was like, well, let's see what happens here. So anyway, I'm holding strong on my, uh, on my yeah, web. The Twitter never yeah. bought a meme coin. Like a bunch of middle-aged women who love yeah. cat videos. And now they're pushing when coin to these middle-aged <laughs> women. Like, I'm sure that's going to translate. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, it, yeah. Here, here's why this matters to me is historically meme coins pop off first in bull runs and then altcoins follow. And altcoin season is much more attractive to me and makes a lot more sense to me. And that is what I'm watching next is, and I don't think we're quite there yet because really what we need for altcoin season to go is we need more retail in the space and we still even though Coinbase app is at number 49 in the app store, we still don't no. really have retail yet. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm telling you, these meme coins got a lot, a long ways to go. You had to have gone through like last cycle. I remember I was like, this is crazy. You need to be selling your meme coins now. You need to be selling whatever. And it's like, they just go and they go and they go. And you're like, how can, like, they'll have crazy pullbacks of like 50% in like a day. And then somehow they'll just rocket past it and go like hundreds of percent. Like, it's nuts. But again, you can use this as sort of a guide to tell you where we're at in the cycle. So even if you don't invest in it, it's good to just be aware of it because it just helps you understand who's coming into the into the market and like where we're at. And so I, I'm pretty sure we're still somewhat early, which is nuts. Which doesn't make any sense. But when token to the moon, Kai. Okay, what else is going crazy this week is some massive purchases in the NFT market. First up here, a crypto punk sold for $16 million this week. That's 4,500 ETH. That was the second highest CryptoPunk purchase ever. The highest was 8 ETH back in 2022, which was $23 million at the time. So 8,000 ETH, seeing... not 80, 8,000. Sorry, 8,000 ETH. Yeah, 8 ETH. Yeah. What a joke, 8 ETH. Look, this is not indicative of the whole NFT market. The whole NFT market is actually, I wouldn't say struggling, but not popping off the way the rest of crypto is popping off right now. The only thing that's really boosting the NFT market is something we've talked about is the airdrop meta. Something we've talked about a bunch on this show is a lot of a lot of NFT communities are getting airdrops coming to them and that is kind of boosting these NFTs, but that's really speculative because you just don't necessarily know which NFT is going to get it. But here's the thing, there are NFTs that have fundamentals that people believe in as historical pieces of art, which is what CryptoPunks is, which is why CryptoPunks are going for these big valuations right now, because we have a lot of people who are like, hey, I want to buy and hold this CryptoPunk forever. I think it's a good investment. And it's not just CryptoPunks that have gone off. We've seen a few other grails go off as well. Two Fidenzas, this week sold for one for 500 ETH and another for 290 ETH. So it's like 2 million and a million respectively. We had a diamond pudgy penguin sell for 150 ETH this week. And over on uh, Bitcoin Ordinals, we had a node monkey sell for nine Bitcoin this week. So we're seeing real high NFT sales, which again, that is not an indication that the NFT market is about to go crazy. That's an indication that there is at the top end of the NFT market, early signs of investors who want to get into that space and want to use that as a way to really leverage their ETH or their Bitcoin. Which, which is generally a signal that the NFT market's coming back. It's kind of yeah. like if you go to the fungible world, Bitcoin dominates, right, to start. And that's your signal like, oh, the rest is coming, but it's usually a bit delayed. 
And I think the NFT market, we don't know this because obviously we've only had one cycle of NFTs, but if you think of what NFTs represent of being sort of like luxury goods in an economy, those typically lag six, nine months, whatever in the real world, like your Rolex watches and stuff will lag to the real economy. And you kind of can play NFTs, the same sort of thing. So I think it is coming to NFTs, but there will be a lag. So, which probably means like now is your signal when these things are getting their big sales, your signal, like you might want to start buying the underpriced ones, undervalued ones. What those are, I, I don't know. That's not my yeah, that, that, That's the tough thing is like, it's tough to know what's undervalued because it's very difficult to know which NFTs actually have value, right? Because a lot of them, you could value the art ones. Okay, I could value those if you believe in the art. But if you're trying to value an NFT that's like a business NFT or like a project, right? Like we're building a metaverse or like even Yuga Labs is tough to value, right? Will they build what they're saying? I don't know, right? Like all these things. Pudgy's one of the only ones that you actually kind of can value because they're building a respectable business that has real revenue that might actually have a way to funnel some of that value to holders. I would say you could value it, but you could believe that it's going to get better and better, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I don't think you can really do like a valuation model on any of these things yet. (laughs) All right, what's next? Okay, let's go to Coinbase. I feel like we talk about Coinbase every week, but for good reason. They introduced a a new smart wallet solution this week. So it's called Coinbase Smart Wallet. And this is really interesting. Look, one of the biggest problems that we all know that exists in the space is the big barriers to entry. It is so complex to onboard to an on-chain app or a dApp. You need to connect your wallet. Often you need to bridge over and fund that wallet with a certain token. You might need to set up a seed phrase because you need a new wallet or you don't have a wallet. Like All these things are so complex. And so Coinbase's smart wallet aims to solve that This is a solution that app developers and engineers can use and plug in very simply to their app. And it's really the first time we've seen this this wallet is built on using account abstraction. And it's the first time we've seen an account abstraction wallet built in a user-friendly way, in a friendly UX. We haven't seen that before. And what that means is that you could use this wallet to set up an account on an on-chain app and you don't need to you don't need to connect it with your existing wallet. You don't need no seed phrase required. This wallet works only off of a pass key. And it also connects into it's a global unified wallet, which means it connects into the Coinbase wallet SDK where you might have a lot of your liquidity and it makes it very simple for you to buy and sell or to swap tokens in order to interact with whatever dApp or game you're interacting with. And these are the, the moments that are setting us up for not just like investment to come into the space, but real on-chain apps to be built that can use crypto, that can use all the benefits that we talk about for so long of using on-chain apps. The, the, the big thing for this, for those that didn't really get that, is like any app that is launching now can put this in into their app and then it makes it very easy for a user to like create an account inside that app. But then instead of having a bunch of separate accounts across every app, you can connect it back to your Coinbase wallet. So it all sort of integrates into one. So it makes much easier for dApps to you know have good wallets and then also much better UX for the user We'll have to just sort of try it and use it to like really understand it. But it's going to make the UX across crypto and across using all these different apps so, so, so much better. And even like Jesse Pollock, who's the the guy who basically from Coinbase who launched Base, was like, this is the most important feature that we've launched since Base. This is the thing that enables us to onboard tens of millions of, of people on chain, which like they can do. They already have tens of millions or hundreds of millions on their app. And this is going to allow them to get over on, t- on chain easily. So it's a really big deal. We got to continue to watch what Coinbase is doing this year because they're just, they're beasts. I don't know what we'd be, where we'd be without Coinbase, to be honest. We wouldn't be far, I'll tell you that. Yeah, no. And shout out to all the work that they do on the political and lobbying side too. I don't envy that work of having to go to Congress and meet with senators constantly and try to convince them and explain to them what crypto is. Okay. Speaking of people not understanding crypto and governments, Kai, what happened in Spain this week? 
Yeah, some of the regulators, data regulators, are demanding, I don't even know if they can do this, but that WorldCoin immediately ceases collecting personal information in the country and they stop using all the data that they've already gathered. This to me is like, you know, that meme of like the old guy from The Simpsons that's just like shouting out at the sky at the cloud and just angry. That's what this feels like to me, because this is obviously people who, I mean, I guess they're data regulators. They should really understand this stuff, but they don't. This is putting data on chain so that you can verify that you're a human, which is something that the, the internet needs so bad. And no government is solving this. We're even remotely close. And WorldCoin is doing this in a very... I wouldn't say fully decentralized way yet, but they have a good path of getting there and they are storing the data on chain. Like they're doing a great job of how they're doing this. And so like, if you really dive into it as a data regulator, for sure, you're like, this is perfect. But obviously they don't get that. So they just immediately go, oh, some company is paying people to give their data. and They're putting it online. Yes, that would be really bad. Like if Facebook was doing this or some other company, like this would be really bad. They would, you would need to control them, right? But they can't do that with WorldCoin. And they just don't understand like this is on chain. It's actually much better. Like there's security ways that are, are are around this that they can't quite comprehend. So they're saying, get rid of it. We don't want it here. I don't even think WorldCoin could do that. There's no way that WorldCoin can comply That's, with this. How could how could a country stop WorldCoin? I yeah. Well, they I can't. guess they they could like stop the orbs, stop the people right. from using orbs. But like you'd literally have to go one at a time and like find the people with the orbs. Yeah, you could ban you yeah. could ban orbs and find people for using orbs in your country. Like okay, right. like you can do that. Good luck. But but then I could go. I could literally cross a border. I could go to France. I could go any you know somewhere else in Europe and sign up there. And then I could it's also build- pretty easy to hide an orb. Like they couldn't even ban Uber or Airbnb. Do you know what I mean? That, yeah. And so like, if you can't stop that, how are you going to stop a little thing that can go in my backpack? I get like, mm-hmm. it's a bit easier to stop Airbnb because it's my freaking home, but they still can't even do that. But so anyway, there's no way they yeah. can stop. A lot of governments but... tried to stop Uber and stop Airbnb. Yeah, of course. Like in, in Vancouver, which is the biggest city that's close to where I live, they did not allow Uber until probably like a year or two ago, which is insane. Yeah, it's, it's uh, wild. But like they did, they did. But you, it's so archaic to think for a government to think that they can stop the advance of technology. And it's not surprising to see Spain do this. They're probably one of like, I would say, uh, oldest and uh, most stodgy governments in the world. But you need to embrace it. And I, I, I don't know. I just hope more governments embrace this stuff. India is a great example. They've done an incredible job of embracing blockchain and building on chain and using it to their advantage and trying to learn about it. The UK also has done that. Uh, but so. not necessarily crypto, right? They've banned a lot of crypto and a lot of exchanges and things like that. Like yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. Okay. <laughs> you know who else is embracing crypto in big ways is fintech. We have seen a couple of big announcements this week out of some of the largest fintech companies in the world. I'm talking about Robinhood and I'm talking about Revolut. So first up, let me tell you what happened with Robinhood. Robinhood has partnered with Arbitrum to enable access to layer two transactions, which means faster speeds and lower costs for Arbitrum wallet users. So if you don't know about Arbitrum wallet, if, or sorry, for Robinhood wallet, if you don't know a Robinhood wallet, Robinhood wallet is, it's their crypto wallet. It's been around for, for a while and it allows you to you know, to buy and sell. I think they offer support for ETH, Bitcoin, Doge, Arbitrum, Polygon, Optimism, Base. There's a whole bunch of tokens they offer support for. And it's a self-custody wallet. But here's the thing. If you want to swap crypto within the wallet across those chains, you couldn't really do it before. Or if you did want to do it, it'd be crazy expensive on the fees. And Robinhood's sitting there and they're saying, hey, look, we see that retail is coming. We see that more people are going to want to not just buy crypto, they're going to listen to Web3 Academy and they're going to be like, hey, should I move from this coin to this coin? Oh, wow. Now's when I should move to ETH. Okay. How do I do that? How do I make that swap? And holy shit, do I have to pay the crazy gas fees that currently exist in order to do that? Well, that's not a good user experience. That's going to lead people to leave Robinhood wallet, which is not what Robinhood wants. So they partner with Arbitrum in order to offer these low transaction fees to their users. I would bet DeFi, access to like DeFi protocols comes next. Like I, I, Robinhood wallet wants to keep it somewhat enclosed because they don't want people to get scammed and lose their assets and stuff. So like kind of like the Reddit style. And so I think they'll slowly bring in like approved protocols and stuff that you could use from the wallet itself. 
But I would imagine that that comes next, which is the DeFi model. The thing that the theory that we've had for many, many years of DeFi the back, fintech in the front. And I think, you know, Robinhood is going to lead that. So is Revolut, who we're about to talk about. PayPal's already starting to do this stuff, but I'll let you take it away on Revolut first. Yeah. So this week, Revolut partnered with MetaMask and essentially announcing that they're going to make it very easy for you to fund your MetaMask wallet using a balance from your Revolut app. So Revolut is one of the largest fintech neobanks in the world, really popular in Europe, especially a lot of our team members here at Web3 Academy use Revolut. That's actually how we pay a lot of them when we pay them in fiat. And what do you do if you have your money in Revolut? Well, you want to transfer it into crypto. Revolut has made it super easy for you to do that. So basically Revolut is kind of turning into, it's turning a crypto on-ramp. It's one of the biggest, I would bet, one of the biggest crypto on-ramps out there. If you want to move into to Bitcoin, you want to move into ETH, whatever it is, super easy to do it with Revolut. Makes a ton of sense. These guys are taking advantage of that. Yeah, fintech companies are basically becoming competitors to Coinbase. They're becoming centralized exchanges, uh, which I mean is good. We, we obviously need more ways to move fiat into crypto. I mean, Revolut, PayPal, Robinhood have had the ability to buy crypto for a while. The unlock here is now moving your crypto off Revolut and putting it on chain, right? That's the big unlock here that Revolut's doing. And so now, and I mean, PayPal already does that. Robinhood now does that too. And so now you have these three big fintech companies where you can buy stocks, you can buy crypto, and now you can move it all on chain as well. So the pipes are just getting bigger and bigger. Speaking of pipes getting bigger, let's talk about some airdrops. Talk about some big time airdrops, Jay. Big time airdrop them like it's hot. We got EtherFi, Wormhole, Camino. Let's start with EtherFi, Kai. I know you're in on this one. What's going on? This is one we've been pushing for a while. And I feel like the EtherFi team has just done an incredible job with their point system. And so EtherFi is the is part of restaking. So basically, it allows you to have a, instead of just like staking your tokens in Eigenlayer, you can just swap your ETH for EETH, or you can run a validator through EETH as well, or through EtherFi as well. And you get an actual restaking liquid token, right? So you can go use that in DeFi or whatever. But what's great is they've had a points program where if you hold EETH, you get points from EtherFi and you get points from Eigenlayer. So it's an airdrop we've covered for a while. It's a pretty big one. They're a pretty legit company. And the date now, at least they said the final countdown is on until March 15th will be the final day, which is when they'll probably announce their tokens and then the token will come soon after that. But they've done these cool things throughout. So if you're a team in in crypto and you're going to do an airdrop, What's really nice about what they've done is they have this point system already, but then throughout it, they've had these like little bonus games where like if you had staked ETH, for example, Lido's um, LST, and you swapped it into ETH during this one week, they call this like a vampire attack. It, they do this with three other tokens as well. But if you swap from those ones, you got like an extra boost. So you got extra bonus points throughout that week. So that got a bunch of capital. I think they're around like close to two, I think it was 2 billion or something like that in value. Now, I, I can't remember exactly what it was, so I might be wrong on that, but I thought I saw a tweet around there. But then this week, what they're doing is it's kind of their final push where you have like one more week and they're calling it the final countdown. And basically, anyone who puts more ETH into ETH during this week is going to get a boost. What's really cool about how they did this is they have a certain amount of tokens that are going to go to the community. And anyone who puts in for every 50K, 50,000 ETH that gets put in, they're going to increase the percent of total tokens that they actually give to the community. And so up to 2%. And so basically you can get to a total allocation of 10% here of the total uh, tokens that they're going to be releasing. So pretty cool that they're doing this. They're actually giving us a way to like get more total tokens of the entire supply. They're close to 100K now already since they launched this, which is a couple of days ago. So pretty cool. If you do put ETH on, Half of those extra points that are going to come from this are going to go to you. The other half goes to people who have already put in ETH. So you're not getting like diluted or anything. So really, really cool way to do it. They've just been like a black hole sucking up ETH uh, and staked ETH, to be honest. So really impressive what they've done. Uh, I think this is going to be a big airdrop and it's coming at some point. Well, at least we'll get the details next week. We'll see what happens uh, on the 15th of March. But if you haven't already done it, you can still go put in and you should be getting something. Next one, Wormhole. This one we've talked about previously, but today they actually, or yesterday, they actually launched the URL where you can go. It's airdrop.wormhole.com. Watch, there's so many fake ones. Airdrop.wormhole.com is the real one. You can go and check how much you can claim. This one is big time. It's currently being estimated that the tokens will be worth about a dollar, 
a dollar fifty, I think was the last I saw. I got a dollar uh, forty nine and a dollar fifty, yeah, on Wales. It's early. Yeah. Okay. So there's there's like pre markets, but this thing's coming any day. We don't know the exact day that they're going to allow you to actually like like then they're going to drop them. But you can see how much you can claim already. So people are getting. I think the minimum was around fifteen hundred W tokens. They're called over a thousand dollars is the minimum, and some are getting way 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 more than that. So I guess at at that amount actually we're we're over two thousand dollars. So this is a big one. I think it was over 100,000 wallets are getting access to this. And by the way, if you merge, like let's say you bridged your ETH on Wormhole from you know Ethereum to Solana, both wallets are eligible for the airdrop. So you want to look and look at your Solana wallet, so your Phantom wallet, let's say, and your Ethereum-based wallet. Even if you ever merged, uh, or I don't know why I keep saying merge, bridged your ETH to like Terra Luna back in the day and you still have that wallet, you are eligible for this airdrop. So you can thank Do Kwan you may have lost all of your Terra Luna, but that made you eligible. It was like the only way to get over to that chain back in the day was Wormhole. So I'm pretty sure I threw out my seed phrase the other day because like, I'm never going to need this again. So I can't even check to see if I'm eligible. So I'm kind of pissed, but it is what it is. So that's funny. But that'll be a big one too. So congrats please, to everyone who got that so one. So this, this one, like based upon this current valuation, roughly $1.50, this could be a $2.5 billion airdrop with wow, just shy of a billion going to the community, up the two point five billion dollars wow. liquidity coming in again. Like here we go again. How much of that goes into meme coins, Jay? I I, I don't know. <laughs> probably probably a lot. That's why meme coins are not stopping. <laughs> Going to keep yeah. going up. Okay, let's go to Camino. Kai, what's going on here? Yeah. So yesterday they put out a tweet. They all said it was tomorrow, and so of course everyone goes nuts. We're like, well, what's tomorrow? And it's like, well, it's probably a token, right? Tomorrow would be today as we record this, which is actually yesterday for the you listening. But anyway, if you go to yeah, if you go to the next tab, the details actually came out just before we started recording. And so the token is going to be called KMNO. This one's interesting. So they didn't do the snapshot yet. Most of the time when people announce yeah. the token's coming, they're like snapshot taken, now it's done. What they said is snapshot is coming March 31st. So you still have the ability to farm this airdrop if you have not put anything on Camino, or if you have, you can increase it. What I really like about what the team did on this one is they're doing sort of like a linear fashion. So based off of the amount of points you've got, which is based on the amount of capital you've put into Camino, let's say you got 1% of all of the points that were put out, you get 1% of all of the tokens that are going to community members. What's really good about this is it doesn't matter if you like split up all of your tokens across a bunch of wallets because you're still just going to get the same amount regardless. So those who try to cheat the system, they're not benefiting at all. All that matters is how much capital you put in and like, did you take a bit, if you took a bit more risk, you get a bit a bit more points. So really nice way to do it. I think it just makes it more fair. I, I believe anyway, others, they like do it per, per like, if you put a certain amount in a wallet, you just get this amount of tokens. And so like, if you just did a little bit in like a hundred wallets, you made way more than someone else. So these guys did it in a more fair way, I think. So this one's good, but yeah, you can still go put in right now and farm this until the 31st. As we look at this, I'm just opening up another tweet right now. You know, we talked about at the beginning of the show, the amount of demand that still is coming in for Bitcoin for the large majors. But look at this list of the anticipated airdrops in the next two to three months and the amount of just think about the amount of liquidity this will bring in. Like, I can't even read this list out. It's so long. Wormhole, like, Parcel, Tensor, Camino, MarginFi, Layer Zero, ZK Sync, Eigenlayer, Avo, Blast, EtherFi, Magic Eden. Most like EtherFi, Magic Eden, Wormhole, and well, Camino's, by the way, is launching in April. So it's not right away. But those three I just said are all the next week. And then that's this is a small list. There's so many more. It's going to grow even further. It's like this yeah. isn't even it. It's, it's nuts. So anyway, congrats to everyone who are doers and actually went out and was able to farm these. Okay, let's go to agree, disagree. Kai, first up here, I got a tweet from Emperor Osmo. He says, if this is your first cycle, let me tell you now, memes are going much, much higher. You ain't seen nothing yet. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I said this at the beginning of the episode. I agree for sure. It's one of those things where you, you wouldn't think it could but if you've been in a cycle before, you've already had that thought and you've realized that it definitely, definitely can. Uh, and you'll have that thought multiple times. Like this is the first time everyone's like, whoa, this meme coin season, this season's going to happen like five times by the time we're done here. And it's just like, it gets weirder and weirder each time. 
So yeah, I full on agree. You, you have to be in a cycle to experience it. And and, and the, the crazy thing about it is it's not up only. And that's the difficult thing. And that's why it gets yeah. so emotional because there's also right. going to be, you know, negative 50% drops. There's going to be, you know, 200% weeks. Like we're just going to see so much. So hold on to your tits, everybody. It's good to get crazy from here. Okay, next up, we got Deeb's DeFi who says, world population, 8.1 billion. Total DeFi users, 7 million. You make up 0.08% of the population. So yeah, you're still early. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more. If you're on crypto Twitter anyway, or you listen to this podcast all the time, you kind of live in a bubble where this is stuff you just hear about and you see all the time. So you, you think you're late. Even now, like, oh, we're at all-time highs. I'm like, I'm late. And you're like, dude, no one knows about any of this stuff yet. And so like, you're still so damn early. It's ridiculous. Echo challenge, like, right? Yeah. The thing is, I don't think the world, like most people in the world just use DeFi protocols in the way that we use them. But once, as we just said, FinTech builds over top of these things and banks do, then the world does, they just don't know it. And that's when this thing is like, whoa. Once you start to realize that, that just like everything that we do in the financial system is just going to be powered by these things in the future. And they're just like underlying, you don't even know it. You're like, oh my God, we're so early. It's ridiculous. And and is that all built on top of layer twos on ETH, which is why there's so much conviction for ETH in the long run? Maybe, could be. I think so. Jesse Pollock says, FYI, Coinbase and Base have done a bunch of consumer research and on-chain outperforms every other word that people use for crypto. If you're using blockchain, Web3, crypto, et cetera, find a way to switch to on-chain and you will be more successful. Fun fact, Jay and I almost changed Web3 Academy to, I don't even want to say this because someone's going to now make it, but to on-chain Academy like six months ago. We never pulled trig on it, but would have been smart. Yana, who's from um, the founder of BlockWorks, he, he put out a really nice tweet here, which said, he actually retweeted Jesse Pollock's and he was like, I don't know about the fancy consumer research, but Jesse's probably right here. As technology evolves, the words to describe it become more efficient. And so if we think back in the day, we used to call email electronic mail. And then it went in like the like late 90s, early 2000s, it was e-mail. And then like you just took away the dash and it became email. We also used to call it weblog. This was like in the 90s. And then it became, but that's with a space. Then it became weblog as one word. And then it became blog, right? Uh, and so it just becomes more and more simple. And then this one, which is interesting, it used to be called picture element. By that, you probably don't even know what the heck I'm talking about. But then it became a pix element. And you're like, okay, maybe I get it. And then it was a pixel. So we all know the word pixel, but there was iterations before that for those that were early, which is where we, this is why we can even say like you're super early. Like we call it blockchain or web three. And now it's like for a little bit there, it was like, is it on chain with a space or is it on chain like together? <laughs> and now it's like, okay, I think we figured out. It's just like, let's just skip that part. We don't need the space moving into one. It's similar to like online. And so it makes complete sense. And this is so important as we look to onboard more people to the space. The reason that crypto gets such a bad rap in the media is quite simply they don't understand it. And the more language we use that's confusing, and sure, it's fun when you're in the in crowd. It's fun to be the one that knows the jokes and understands them. So you use that language, but that's not inclusive. That's not welcoming. That's not accessible. And so I got to give a shout out to Jesse Pollock and the Coinbase team for really being the ones to take the lead here to say, okay, here's the words that we should use that are going to get us to that next billion well, on-chain users. The, the funny thing is, it's just because we've tarnished all the other words. Like, crypto <laughs> was great until we had all those ICOs and everyone blew up their companies. And then FTs were cool for a bit. And then also those went to zero and everyone started bragging about how much they made. And everyone's like, I hate NFTs, these are stupid. And it's like, we just have to keep changing. So then we went to Web3 and now we're like, all right, that's kind of shit too. Now we got to go to on chain. It's like, so I don't know, maybe even on chain is going to suck. And if you probably at the end of this cycle, we'll blow up that word too. <laughs> Stick around for another few years and we'll tell you what it is. Yeah, okay, yeah. Next we'll time, it's a uh, tweet from Pentoshi. He says, we haven't seen anything yet in terms of alts. It's a matter of when, not if. And then he's got a screenshot of the total crypto market cap, excluding Bitcoin and ETH. So we've talked a lot about the total crypto market cap. We talk about it at the beginning of every episode when we look into market watch and it's flying. It's flying off the handle, right? It's over uh, $2 billion now, $2.4 billion. 
But if you exclude Bitcoin and ETH, what you see here is that we're actually still quite far from all-time highs. All-time highs, if you exclude those, is about like 1.1 trillion. And we're only at about 650 billion right now. And for more perspective on this, so like Bitcoin, obviously at all-time highs, Ethereum still, I don't know what the percent is, but let's say 10, 15%, whatever it is away from all-time highs. And all it's 50%. And the other thing is, is that in this cycle, Bitcoin last cycle went up like, 3x from its previous, a little over 3x from its previous all time high. Ethereum was like three and a half. And then alts are way higher than that, right? So, like, not only do we have a lot more to go to get to all time highs, they also are going to probably do way more x's than Ethereum and Bitcoin. So, when you talk about we haven't seen anything yet in alts, I, that's a definite agree. Which alts do you like the most? Oof. Um, I don't go too far down the risk curve, so it's a tough one. Yeah. My thing is like I don't trade very often, so I want to hold on to some things that I think are going to do well this cycle, like throughout most of the cycle, not just like on a monthly basis kind of thing. And then probably will still do pretty well in the bear. I think they all are going to get wrecked, so I will get out of them, but they won't be the ones that drop like 100% in like a day kind of thing. And so some of the big L2s, the only reason I really continue to hold those is like I've had those since they were at a very, very low and so like, I still think they have plenty of room to go. My trade's not over on those. So like, I feel really confident in those to do well this cycle. They're not just like a narrative, like an AI token right now, or a meme coin where like it could drop off at any second. So those, like, I just, I'm very confident they're going to do well. So L2s, Soul obviously is one that I'm going to continue to hold on to. I think is going to do really well. I had some AI stuff that I got before any of this craze went. I still think there's lots of room for that to go. So like Akash and Near, which I put out in the portfolio in Pro, those are ones that I've had and held to the bear. And they're just, they're going absolutely nuts over the last couple of weeks. But again, still early. So those are the main ones. Okay, next up, we got one from the DeFi Edge. It says, some narratives such as all L1s, AI will remain strong throughout the cycle, but stay flexible. New sectors will come out of nowhere. Last cycle, there was move to Earn and Olympus Dow Forks. Remember, people love new shiny objects. Yeah, you got to be careful on narratives too. Like if you can find the narratives before they hit, then it's huge, right? Like I said, like being in AI tokens, before they were even AI tokens, like Akash was not an AI token years ago. It was just uh, like a decentralized compute and it just happened, AI comes along and it's like, well, we need this stuff more than any other industry. And you're like, sweet, we've got a new customer for this one, right? If you can be in it before the narrative, that's what really matters. The other thing to keep in mind is like, just because it's a narrative now doesn't mean it remains a narrative. Like, play to earn and move to earn are not really at all like exist anymore. But those were massive narratives for a bit. Same with the Olympus, Olympus Dow stuff from way before, like those all blew up. And so like, there are certain narratives that will go and they'll make it through to the next cycle. But there are many narratives that are just a fad and they're just noise. And so you need to try to figure out how to separate the signal from the noise, which isn't the easiest thing to do, but that's what we try to do at in our pro. So if you're not a pro subscriber, there's another reason to subscribe. Separate the single sing, signal from the noise. Okay, next up, last one. We got George Robinson. He says, man, this year is going to be wild. Out of control fiscal spend, US stronger and more risk-free than ever. A crazed contested election is likely. A Fed that has erased itself in terms of efficacy and the size and monstrosity of this economic expansion, expansion just starting to dawn on folks. What's actually a little bit wild as I read, as you read that tweet out is all throughout the bear market, a lot of our pro reports, a lot of our discussion was around liquidity. And we're like, liquidity is what drives these cycles. Okay. It's not the Bitcoin having and none of that stuff, right? It's liquidity coming to the system. It's why we have cycles in all assets. And the liquidity part of that cycle has just started. All the bullishness we talked about the market watch section at the beginning of this episode was things specific to this industry and liquidity coming in this industry, but that's not liquidity expanding the entire like all the economies and the like the fiat liquidity right and that is just starting like interest rates are still five percent we are printing money but it's not like overly yet but that is going to have to happen soon to pay for and refinance all the debt that governments have so like we're just starting on that liquidity cycle which makes you wonder and think our thesis of can this thing two three whatever x in 90 days like if that liquidity starts to expand like now which it already is there's so much more room to go. Holy this is the article to go bullish here. episode, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, baby. Oh, baby. The times are good. Everybody is feeling strong. I hope you guys are feeling good. We're certainly feeling good. 
If you got a question or anything you need help with, look, we're your buddies. We're your crypto buddies. We want to separate the signal from the noise. We want to make sure you know what's going on. So don't hesitate to drop a question in the comments if you're listening on YouTube. Jump into our Discord. Links in the show notes. Subscribe to our newsletter. Reply to their newsletter with a question. We will always respond and make sure you guys feel good, you feel confident, and you feel ready to take advantage of the opportunity that is still very much to come. You know, I think there's one thing this episode taught me, Kai. I don't know if I'm bullish enough, which is insane to say right now. Maybe we're the top signal. We're starting to sound pretty toppy. I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> Next week. All right, everybody. Bear. Wrap up every episode day. all about bear. <laughs> Next weekend, the bears are out. We'll see you guys next week. Have a good weekend. Touch some grass. Practice gratitude. See you later. Thank you for listening to Web3 Academy, your one trusted source to capitalize on the next big phase of the internet. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and subscribe or follow so that you don't miss the next one. While you're at it, there's a link in the description for our free newsletter where we provide timely and relevant Web3 insights so you can confidently build and invest in Web3. Make sure to subscribe today. One final note. This podcast is for educational purposes only and nothing we say is financial advice. Crypto and Web3 are risky and you should never invest more than you're willing to lose. Thank you, friends, and see you in the next one.